third webinar in our spring series for Meta Asset Management. Delighted that everybody could join this evening and uh, great to have with us today Ron Moore from uh, the USA. Ron is going to talk to us today about operational excellence and reliability and maintenance and I think you're going to hear an awful lot of really good material uh, from Ron. Ron has been in this asset management and maintenance and reliability and operational excellence uh, game for many, many years. He has been a consultant for a long time. He is a multiple author of a lot of very good books, including um, probably one of my favorite books on this whole subject called Making Common Sense, Common Practice. And I would uh, really uh, recommend anybody who's interested in this subject reads that book. And he is, I suppose, a real expert and a, a, a very much uh, an authority on all of the strategies and practices that you need to put in place to ensure operational excellence in your plants. He has clients in North and South America, uh, Australia, Europe, Asia, Africa. There's nowhere he hasn't been or he hasn't consulted in. And he's the managing partner of the RM Group, Inc., for the last 27 years. Uh, and prior to that, he was president of Computational Systems, Inc., or CSI. He has uh, bachelor's and master's degrees in engineering and MBA. He's a professional engineer, registered engineer, and he's a certified maintenance and reliability professional. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to let Ron take it away. Uh, in terms of questions and answers, if you use the Q&A tab rather than the chat tab at the end of the Zoom screen, uh, we will go through the questions at the end of the presentation. The presentation is going to be about 45 minutes and we'll have about 15 minutes of Q&A. And if you type in your question, I will then uh, ask Ron uh, the question and he'll answer it at the end. OK, and uh, enjoy the presentation and I'll hand it over to you, Ron. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And thanks for the introduction. Uh, just uh, one comment. The more I know, the more I know I don't know. So I think uh, most people should take that view of being sort of a continuous learner. Anyways, uh, I wanted to thank everybody. I mean, I'm, it's just after supper over there, I reckon. And so you might have, uh, you know, had a big meal and maybe a pint or whatever. So you might not be as alert as you otherwise would be if it were eight o'clock in the morning. So we're gonna be uh, fairly quickly or fairly fast paced on the presentation. Uh, fasten your seat belts. Uh, we're gonna move through this uh, very quickly. Now, I've got more material to cover than I'm able to cover uh, in the limited time we have. So I've uh, sent to uh, Marin a uh, PDF of all the slides that you can go back and have a look at at your leisure or go back and review if you miss something that we cover. So let's get right into it. Uh, well, as Jim said, we're gonna talk about operational excellence, that is achieving reliability through a production and maintenance partnership. And I can't emphasize enough the need for that partnership. And we'll get to some of the data momentarily. And really what I wanna do with you is share with you some of my thoughts, You know what I've learned over the years, but what I expect I will continue to learn as folks ask questions and as you come across different issues. So we're gonna look at the concept of reliability and operational excellence. Uh, what does it look like? How do we measure it? How do we get it? And one of the keys to get it is what I said earlier, a production and maintenance partnership. And we'll talk about the characteristics of that. Then we'll get a little bit into, into leadership, alignment, managing cultural change. And of course, a little bit on implementation. So what does it look like? Well, you know, I just let you read down through this, just highlight excellent leadership, organizational alignment, and an operational culture that's pervasive around reliability. And if you have all that, then the rest of that list there comes almost naturally. If you don't have that, the rest of that list is much more difficult to achieve. So uh, what does it require? Well, I said this just now, excellence in leadership or what I call sponsorship. 
you know, a lot of folks will assign somebody to go find, you know, operational excellence, reliability, asset management, whatever. And then they walk away. I've done that. He's, you know, that guy or that woman is responsible, but it really takes active sponsorship, active engagement, much the same as you would have if you were focused on safety. You know, the leadership doesn't abandon or abdicate their responsibility for safety. Neither can they for reliability and operational excellence. Again, organizational alignment with some common goals that everybody focuses on, defers to as appropriate. A, you know, design, procurement, operations, and maintenance individually doing well, but also, and more importantly, working together to that common purpose, those common goals. And that's where a lot of folks tend to fall over and not do that so well. Shared measures across functions to facilitate that collaboration, that, you know, achieving those common goals. And an operational culture, an engaged workforce. Most folks are not engaged. You know, about 30% are truly engaged, 50% are sightseeing and 20% are actively disengaged. So it's really important that you have processes to engage the entire workforce. And again, safety and reliability are on an equal plane because a reliable plant is a safe plant, is a cost-effective plant. So, now here's some benchmarks. I don't have time to go through all these benchmarks. They'll be in the packet that we send you. But one of the things I want you to understand about these benchmarks is this. You must understand the processes for achieving this benchmark performance. It's not about the numbers. It's about getting the right processes in place and the numbers take care of themselves. And don't use any one measure to make any decisions. I see that too often. Folks will home in on a number or two numbers, but these numbers all affect one another. And if you focus on one, you're likely gonna do that to the detriment of the others. And then the system as a whole, its performance will likely not do as well as you had hoped. So at some point, you might wanna take some of these numbers, compare yourself to these and see how you well, how you compare and some of the things you might need to do. So here's a favorite quote of mine from Deming. Your system is perfectly designed to give you the results that you get. So obvious corollary to that is if you're not happy with your results, then you have to change the system. And so as we go through this material, what I'd like you to be doing is be thinking about saying things that you might want to do to change the system so you get better results. Now, I also wanna to offer to you a, a new definition for reliability. You know, SMRP, SAE, they have definitions and it's focused on equipment, you know, the probability that a, Equipment will perform at a certain level of, under certain conditions and all that sort of thing. And that's all good stuff. The problem is maintenance does not control reliability, at least how <clears throat> as I've defined it. In fact, downtime is not a good measure of reliability, at least how I've defined it. I'm not suggesting you don't measure it. Of course you do. But it's not the end all. It's not the best measure. What I'd like you to do is think about process reliability. Process reliability, that is the ability of a system, a plant, a production line to deliver quality product on time at the lowest sustainable cost. That's process reliability. It includes the equipment. And the best measure, I think, for process reliability is OEE, and I know we're going to talk a little bit, a little bit in depth about this because I want to share some, uh, you know, other thoughts with you about that. So here's, you know, notionally, it's a, a graph or a picture of what it looks like. 
you know, you've got scheduled to non-scheduled downtime. You've got rate and quality losses. You've got changeover transition losses. You've got no demand or market losses. Now, no demand market losses, that's part of your asset utilization. OEE is in the blue. No demand market losses subtracts, you subtract that out and you get net asset utilization for the business. The plant controls the blue. The market and executives and so on, they control all the losses. And I'd like you to think about this as a measure of your capital efficiency. How well are you using your capital? Don't spend more money on capital if you're not using what you have effectively. And all of this is based on your maximum demonstrated sustainable rate. And we'll come back to that and talk about what that might mean in just a second. So as you know, OEE is literally equal to available, availability times rate times quality. So if each one of those is 95%, what do you get? Well, you get 85% net. Well, what if you string three or four processes together? What do you get out the back end of a complex system? Well, you get more like 50 or 60%, which is not very good. So each one of these needs to be very high in order for system level performance to be superior. And that's hard. So typical batch, uh, 50, 60% OEE, typical process, maybe 70 to 80% versus best in class up in the 80, 85, 90% or more. You know? So we want to use the maximum demonstrated sustainable rate for this. Now, the max rate is based on your judgment, but it must be challenging. You know, you don't put slop in there. You don't sandbag the numbers so you can make it all the time. I've been to plants where they're talking about achieving 105% OEE. Well, that's just bull crap. You know, it's just not possible. So how do we judge what that is? Well, here's some suggestions. Maybe it's in the 95th percentile that you've achieved to date, or maybe it's the best three days ever for a given product or production line. Maybe it's the best three shifts. Maybe it's the best cycle time or yield for each product to date. But the point again is, that I'm gonna leave it to your judgment, but it ought to be something that you rarely achieve, but you want to aspire to achieve that routinely. And that will measure your genuine losses. So how do we get this? Well, here's some thoughts about that as well. You wanna map your processes and identify your constraints. In combination plants, measure OEE at each of its design constraints or bottlenecks. You may have multiple constraints for multiple products. Identify those. For batch, your changing rate for each may be too complex. So then normalize that to something that's representative of the product mix and the rate at which you make it. So you're gonna do a weighted average, for example. Losses include setup, cleanup, and time between batches and runs lack of upstream supply, inability to send it downstream. So if you make something, you can't send it downstream, you have shut down, that's a loss. Batch yield being less than ideal. So in my view, and it's not the same as Nakajima's, but in my view, you measure all your losses 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 52 weeks out of the year. And then you manage those. And again, the no demand time is market opportunity. That's product you could or capacity that you have that you could go sell against the existing assets and you could in effect make it cheaper because you're not having to build new plant and amortize that against new production. So now here's a, a set of four different configurations to try to illustrate a really important point here about what do you measure and where do you measure it? Now you are 
more than likely going to need some automated systems for this. So you may have to spend some money to measure this effectively. But I want to make a, a really important point here. Any one of these pathways can be simplified to number four. So number four, five feet four and so on. One happens to be the bottleneck. The red is the bottleneck. But any one of these pathways can be simplified into a single pathway. And you'll have to set up a measurement system for each pathway. So don't let the system overwhelm you. Simplify it. Make multiple pathways if you need to. And then measure against that pathway at its bottleneck and measure all your losses. So your key goals here are to assure accuracy and sustainability. You don't want to start and quit. Measure all losses. I said that earlier. Each shift or operator inputs the data into the system. This data is not input at the end of the week or at the end of the day by the shift supervisor. You want the operators to assume a degree of ownership for this data and to begin to work with you to minimize the losses and address the problems. The system must be easy to use. So it's probably gonna be automated to some extent and training folks and how to use it is really important. Supervisory, re the supervisors review the data to assure accuracy. And then they do some coaching, correction, and refinement as you learn, particularly if you're new at this. And it'll take you a while. It'll take you several months to get a proper system in place. You want to align the definitions of losses from the operator to the site manager so that you have a common understanding of what they represent. And folks have to understand that. And I'll skip that one. That's uh, for another day. Other comments. Traditional, I said this earlier, traditional OE does not account for all the losses. It only looks at planned production time. I don't agree with that. I mean, it's, a, it's good, There's nothing wrong with it, but I think you should measure all losses for the business and then manage the losses. It often excludes some of the things we've mentioned earlier, planned maintenance downtime and so on. Again, recommend measuring and managing all the losses. And then the focus here is on managing losses. It is not OE or that number per se. You want to identify, you want to manage the losses. Some of them will be acceptable, by the way. You, you may, if you get down to 1% unplanned downtime, that's probably acceptable if you can sustain it. And each of these categories of losses will be acceptable or unacceptable based on your judgment about how well you should be able to manage those. And anyways, focus on managing the losses. Local managers may not be able to address some losses, but they still need to be managed and maybe they kick it upstream or up, you know, up the staircase, whatever. So how do we support this? Well, I'm a big uh, proponent of applying what I call the reliability process. And that is we design, buy, store, install, startup, operate and maintain so that we eliminate these defects that are at the root cause of our rate losses, our downtime, our unnecessary work, our injuries. Yeah, the more defects you have, the more injuries you're gonna have. I've got lots of data on that. So we're gonna manage the losses. So design has to do with life cycle cost, not initial cost, not lowest installed cost. Buy has to do with the total cost of ownership, not the price. You know, those things, you can buy cheap and spend the money later, or you can do it right in the first place and spend less money later. Run your storeroom like a store, like a business, like you care. Install and start up with discipline. Your greatest risk of inducing defects and having losses is that startup. I'm sure many of you have experienced that. So you better manage it. 
operate with care, maintain with precision. Now, notice in the defect boxes, three of them are bigger than the other three. Well, there's a point to that. That's where most of the defects occur that create the costs and the losses. And I said it earlier, maintenance does not control reliability. You can't maintain your way to better reliability. You can get some improvement, but the defects have to be managed upstream and, and you have to have really good maintenance practices. I don't wanna negate maintenance, maintenance or say it's not important, it's critical, but you gotta control the defects first. And then if you do, you're gonna have much better maintenance performance. All right. Now, by the way, there's a chapter on each one of those uh, you know, blocks in my book, Making Common Sense, Common Practice, but we don't have time to cover all that. So I do wanna focus on just a little touch on operating practices. Now, here's a quote from Charlie Bailey. He's retired now. He said, reliability cannot be driven by the maintenance organization. It must be driven by the operating units and led from the top. I said earlier, executive leadership, sponsorship led from the top. You know, he tried to get better reliability by focusing on maintenance, you know, planning and scheduling, predictive maintenance systems, blah, blah, blah. And he got a little bit of improvement, but it wasn't much. It wasn't until he went to the production managers, the operating managers have said, I'm holding you responsible for reliability, for maintenance schedule compliance, for maintenance and repair costs, because that's where the defects are coming from. I want you to be responsible for that. And he also went to the maintenance guys and said, you're going to be partly responsible for the on-time and full delivery. And when he did that, those guys had to work together, surprise, surprise, and they got much, much better performance. So another way of thinking about that is to expect maintenance to own reliability is like expecting the mechanic at the garage to own the reliability of our cars. Well, the mechanic at the garage can't. They can help. They can do repairs and do PMs, but you as the owner have the primary responsibility for the reliability of that car. And I still have my old Jeep Cherokee. It's an 88. It's got 500,000 K or so, or 300 and some odd thousand miles. That's my car. I drove it over to take a hike today in the woods. So now back to the OEE measure. Now I've said this several times now, maintenance doesn't control reliability, process production plant reliability. So here's what I typically see if we measure OEE. And let's say we, we're measuring 70% OEE. So that means you've got 30% losses. Well, it turns out if you go look at the data in most plants, you may be different, but in most plants that I've been in, 20% of that, two thirds, it has nothing to do with the equipment, particularly in batch plants. It's changeovers, product process changeovers, rate and quality losses, raw material problems, market demand issues, production planning. Of the one third, the 10% that is equipment related, go to root cause, what you typically find is that two thirds of that is because of poor operation or in some cases, poor design. It's hard to operate. It's hard to maintain. And that leaves maintenance in control of only about 10% of that process reliability, those losses in our OEE measure. Now, here's a little bit of data from the University of Tennessee here where I live. I, I work with those guys and they collected data from 200 plants. Here we got maintenance costs as a percent of equipment cost on the vertical axis, level of operator care on the horizontal axis with level four being the lowest, which is what? Regular PM checks and some repairs. Simple repairs. We're not talking about operators overhauling a compressor or, 
or overhauling a turbine or anything like that. Just simple, basic stuff, kind of like a maintenance helper would do. Tightening a nut, you know, doing maybe as appropriate if they're trained, a little bit of lubrication, doing some TLC, tighten, lubricate, clean. Now, facilitating a partnership. So let's talk about that, this production maintenance partnership. Well, before you start into that, the leadership establishes the higher level goals and instructs everybody that that's what we're trying to achieve. That comes first, even if you have to defer your, per, your departmental goal to achieve that. The production plan and the maintenance plan are integrated into one plan. I don't like two separate plans. I don't think that works very well. It allows for a lot of finger pointing. And that plan is led by production because that's where the money is. Production and maintenance are both accountable for plan compliance, for maintenance and repair costs, for maintenance and PM schedule, and for on-time delivery, for your production plan schedule compliance, if you will. There is structured improvement time using cross-functional teams, folks from operators and maintainers. So what does that mean? Well, you're gonna pick a machine that's not working quite right. You're gonna make it right based on their input and their, in effect, sometimes you just clean the machine. You find all kinds of defects, you make it right. Or you might pick a procedure or process, you make it right. And then you repeat and you repeat and you repeat until you've gone through everything in the operation. And by that time, something will have gone wrong. And with the first one, you start over. And you have monthly meetings to review progress and problems and to work those issues out. So operator care and monitoring tasks are reviewed with maintenance for opportunities <clears throat> and for identification of changes. Maintenance and PM tasks, <clears throat> excuse me, are reviewed with operations for opportunities. And you're gonna do this in a cooperative, collaborative sense with a purpose of achieving improvement. Operations will clean, prepare the machine or the area for maintenance. Maintenance will leave that area clean like new, no garbage and trash and crap laying around. Interfacing with operations to assure the work has been done properly. Routine communication and cooperation will adjust this approach as needed. So there's a lot of, remember you're going, you're trying to achieve a common purpose. You got folks working together on machines or procedures or standards to achieve that. Now, here's another way of thinking about all that. I got a couple of pyramids here. This one on the left, that's the equipment reliability pyramid from Lede. On the right, well, Hopkins, he calls it process safety. I call it the operational pyramid. But at the very bottom, you got defects lead to repairs and so on until you have a major incident. On the right, you got numerous process errors, not running stuff properly, ultimately results in a major accident. The point being, defects create process errors. Process errors create defects. And either way, you're going to wind up with something bad happening. So those folks have to work together to minimize that risk. Okay, let's talk a little bit about leadership, alignment, managing cultural change. That's a hard one for most folks. And performance measurement. Here's my definition of leadership. One, one of my guys, when I was president of CSI, they said, well, Ron, what do you think leadership is? And this is what I said to him. It's the ability to inspire ordinary people to consistently perform at an extraordinary level. Now, I don't mean ordinary in any sort of pejorative sense. I mean, ordinary in the sense of regular people doing a superior job because you put them into superior systems. You give them the time, the tools, the training, the, the processes, you make it, you fix it so that they can perform in a superior manner. 
And sometimes you go talk to them about what the issues are and they'll tell you, and then you work with them to achieve that superior performance. It really begs the question, how do I get people to genuinely look forward to coming to work every day? Well, you give them work they'd like to do. You put them on the improvement team. You thank them when they do a good job. You go talk to them, ask them about, you know, what the issues are, what they think you should do, what you think they should do. Every now and again, you send them off to a training course that's proximate to the need. You can't send somebody for training uh, today and then they don't use what they've learned a month or three months from now. Half-life on that kind of training is about a week. So in a month, most of it's gonna be gone. So it has to be proximate, small bites, short doses. So you train, you apply, you train, you apply, you train, you apply. Here's Winston Ledet's definition of leadership. It floats to the person best qualified to eliminate the defects. The nature of the work determines who's in the lead position. Types of leaders, executive leaders provide the vision, the resources, operational leaders provide the time and network. I call it shop floor leaders provide the ideas. 70% of all improvement ideas come from the shop floor. If you're not talking to those guys, you're missing a bit. If you want, well, I just said that. If you want to understand the problems with the work, talk to the workers. I mean, that seems like such an obvious thing to me. And if you don't do it, get off your butt and go talk to them. Most organizations are not aligned. I'll give you a minute to, or a few seconds to read down through this. Just read this. Boy, isn't that awful? That's awful. Let's suppose it's not really that bad. It's twice as good. It's still awful. Consider the consequences of this. If you were a coach and your team's athletes felt this way. Well, my basketball team this time of year must have some similar problems because they are just awful this year. So you've got to have these issues addressed so how do you know why 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 do we need to align an organization you know we say this all the time well there's been some research done on this and what they found is as task interdependence increases teamwork becomes critical for organizational success i want to read that again as task inter dependence increases. Teamwork becomes critical for organizational success. So is there task interdependence between production and maintenance? Well, you think between shifts, between marketing and manufacturing, you have all these interdependencies. And as they intensify, teamwork becomes essential. Alignment requires the creation of superordinate goals that take priority over group interests. I've said that two or three times so far. So you develop partnership agreements and shared measures between competing groups. We've covered that, so get on it. You think at a systems level, that is don't optimize as a lot of people do at the suboptimal level in your little silo. Think about what effect it's gonna have on the other functional elements in order to achieve the superordinate goals. Okay, I spent a minute on managing cultural change. Here's a little process model. So how do we do that? Well, step one, articulate a compelling reason for change. You gotta create a little bit of positive tension. Number two, communicate your strategy, goals, and roles repeatedly over and over and over and over. You can't just say it once. No people will remember it. Half-life on that memory is one week. So a couple of weeks from now, it'll be gone. Apply leadership and management principles. Leaders want change. Managers want stability. Well, you have to do both. 
You can't just do one. Think of it as a stair step. You challenge the status quo, you ramp up, you stabilize with procedure, standards, checklists. You challenge the status quo, you ramp up, you stabilize. You got to do both. Facilitate employee implementation of the change process. People own what they create. You have to make them part of the creative process. You have to go talk to them. How many times have I said that? Measure the results, reinforce good behavior, challenge bad behavior. You know, some people won't want to play in your sandbox. Well, they either have to play according to whatever rules you've established, or maybe they don't get to play in your sandbox at all. Stabilize the change in the new order, procedures, standards, checklists, training, and so on, and then repeat. So, you know, a lot of folks out there say people don't want to change. Well, I think that's wrong. I think people do want to change, but there's some caveats. If given compelling reasons for change, that's a caveat. That's really important. Otherwise, why bother? If there's something in it for them, that's kind of the motivational piece. More secure future, less risk, better pay. And most importantly, I think, if they participate in making the changes. So you got to have structured improvement time. They got to have the tools. You got to listen, act on their ideas. All three ifs must be addressed to align their personal interests with corporate interests. <clears throat> if the change, excuse me, if the change takes longer than executive or organizational attention span, it is doomed to failure. Too often, companies change site managers, site management teams every couple of years. Well, that's not long enough attention span to make this happen. Constancy of purpose is essential. That's a Deming quote, by the way, another, another one of my favorite quotes. Constancy of purpose is essential. So let's talk a little bit about performance measures. Our measures must, 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 must expose our weaknesses so we can improve them. So OEE is a good measure if you do it right, of your weaknesses, must facilitate collaboration. I gave you some examples of that. Across functional boundaries, particularly when you have high task interdependence, must have the right balance of leading and lagging indicators. Leading indicators, that's the thing the shop floor does. Lagging indicators, that's the results. If you focus only on lagging indicators, you're looking in a rear view mirror to see where you've been. You're not looking ahead to do the right things that get you there. Must matter, that is be used to drive behavior, but must have the proper balance to facilitate collaboration. Must be visible and current. I've been in plants where you look up and it says, uh, you know, data from July 2020. Well, shoot, it's March 21. Must not be important. And finally, limited to our span of control and ability to manage. I've also been in plants where they had 25 measures. Whatever's important has been lost in the fog. So you ought to limit it maybe to five. And if if those cascade, fine, develop your cascade and then hold the next level down accountable for the five that's important to them. To facilitate collaboration between production and maintenance. This is the third time you've seen this. Hold both accountable for maintenance and repair costs, maintenance PM schedule compliance, on-time delivery. Stores and maintenance, hold both accountable for inventory turns on parts. Stock out rate, see the Maintenance manager wants one of everything, a spare plant. The accounting guy, the purchasing guy, they don't want anything. Well, neither one of those is acceptable. So if you measure, facilitate these guys working together, they'll get the balance right, or they'll come much closer to it. 
project and operations hold both accountable for unit costs, maintenance and repair costs. See, project guys dust their hands off sometimes and off you go. Well, that's not very healthy. In fact, you might want to make the maintenance engineer the project engineer, or sorry, the project engineer, the maintenance engineer for two years after startup. Gives them a whole new, you know, what purpose when they're doing their project if they know they're going to be held to account for what happens after. So here's some examples of operator leading indicators. You may have better ones for your operation. I just wanted to give you some examples. So I'll let you read through these. Again, the purpose of this is to get operators involved in addressing issues and problems. So you should talk to them about whatever you select so they can work with you and have a sense of ownership for it. Here's some maintenance ones. You know, these are supposed to be things they have some direct hands-on control of that gives them purpose for improving. And then of course, in the executive suite, you're gonna make more money, have better market share, all that good stuff, you know, those lagging indicators. So kind of quick summary of all this, your measurements must expose your weaknesses, foster collaboration, give more attention to the leading indicators, do the right things and the right things will happen. Uh, asset management, let's see, I'm gonna skip this in the interest of time. I do wanna point out though, that your asset management strategy must include production, maintenance, uh, marketing and sales and so on. Because if the business is closing, that's a different asset management strategy than if it's being sold, than if it's stable with slow growth, than if it's growing rapidly. Each one of these requires a different strategy. So, the design folks, the production folks, the operating folks, you know, the maintenance folks, and the marketing guys often all have to be involved in helping create the asset management strategy. It's not just a maintenance thing. So strategy for implementation. Okay, fourth time it has to be led from the top. Executive sponsorship is essential and permission is not sponsorship. Leadership requires active engagement. It, that's essential, much as the same as this for safety. You have to have a good production and maintenance partnership. Clear goals, expectations must be set and reasonably achievable. Shared performance measures. We touched on some examples of that. And a shop floor engagement process cross-functional teams using structured improvement time and a support structure to facilitate all that. If you miss any one of these, particularly that first one, you're far less likely to be successful. If you cover all these and do it well, I feel confident you will be successful. So engage the entire workforce. Only about 30% are engaged. Eliminating small day-to-day -day problems has a much bigger impact on results than focusing on the major failures. I've got data on that. Engaged employees are three times more productive. Think if you could take those 30% who are truly engaged and make that 50%. Nothing changes until the shop floor does things differently. So considering all this, how will you, as executives, leaders, managers, engineers, whatever you are, assure operational excellence, a safe, cost-effective, reliable operation? And with that, I turn it back to Jim for maybe a few questions and answers. Yeah, very good, Ron, and thank you very much. Can you hear me okay, Ron? I can, sure. Excellent, excellent. Listen, that was a really good presentation. Um, very thought provoking. And I suppose I've, I've, I've heard some of that before. I've heard some of that before from yourself. And I think one of the things that strikes me is how has this never been adopted 
uh, on a grander scale and, and what's holding us back because we seem to be making very slow progress. Um, I don't know about yourself, but have you seen this improve in the last 20 to 25 years or is it is it static or is it disimproving the overall deployment of good practice like this well there's a, a much greater awareness of these principles <clears throat> excuse me these principles and issues but there's less implementation but the, the short answer is yes i have seen improvement uh, over the past 25 years at the current rate though i'll be long gone <laughs> before this is, you know, kind of routinely practiced. So uh, that, in, in my mind, the real issue is the lack of leadership at the very senior levels, the CEO, VP of operations or yeah. manufacturing at that level. I don't think they have a good grasp or understanding of these principles because they're focused on so many other things related to the business and the stock market and, you know, the return on investment to their investors and the share price, they really, the ones I've come across really don't have a good grasp and understanding of all this and the potential for the impact that it can have on their business, their market share and their share price. So yeah, until we get yeah. them fully educated, indoctrinated and so on, it's going to be a real slow slog. Okay. Okay. But you guys, you Question guys, right now, you've got a huge opportunity, right? <laughs> With the yeah. vaccines, how are we doing over there in the plants? I, I don't answer that. I'll... <laughs> so <We're> doing okay. <laughs> okay. Well, good. So, in terms of okay, another question here then uh, from John Coleman, and it's it's all about um, how is the Internet of Things changing the concept of OE given you know today's machines gather enormous amounts of data from sensors and how is well, that affecting the way that OEE has been managed and acted upon well you know i'm truthfully i'm not familiar enough with the impact that that might be having but i, I can just give you a general impression we have tons of data and damn little information yeah. So I, yeah. I don't have the impression that the Internet of Things is being used effectively to condense all that data into actionable items that you can then go and take to the guys on the floor or to the middle managers or, for that matter, to the executives and assure that those uh, changes, those recommendations are made. I, I, I don't want to, you know, belittle you know, IOT, because I think it's really an important tool for the future. But right now, I think we're just in the, the infancy of effectively applying it. So I think okay. if you could have a good system at the, you know, at the operational level, at the line level, to collect the information you need to manage it, you know, manage OEE effectively, that'd be a giant leap forward. Mm -hmm. Very good. Another question here from Pat Murphy. Um, he says, thank you for the excellent presentation. For a company or group of sites within the same division that wish to begin the journey of operational excellence, process efficiency, what is your advice and guidance? Uh, hire an external consultant initially. Um, do you appoint personnel as change agents then when you get into the project? Uh, do you send them for training such as Lean Six Sigma? How, how would you kick this off? Well, it would depend on the, the level of expertise I have in-house. You know, if, if I don't have anybody in-house that has done, been there and done that, as they say, I would probably hire some external expertise to come in and set things up, get things going. You need to make sure that they understand, though, that they're there for a limited time. They're going to transfer their knowledge to you so that you can then take it over and run with it. And now, if you do have that internally, and I know some companies do, uh, you know, at least for a time they did, that DuPont, that Hercules Chemicals, and that, that Kodak, because the, the two guys that I suggest to folks, you know, David Brown and, um, and Bob Hansen, they ran the OEE system within their, within their operations. And 
So they were quite competent. If you don't have that, if you're new to it, well, you probably need to hire some external resources to help facilitate that. Yeah. Does, think, does that answer the question though? I think it does. Yeah. I, I think okay. uh, to be perfectly honest, knowing what I know about organizations and the, the level of knowledge within organizations, they really yep. should bring somebody in. I think where I would see yourself being of great use would be being brought into the um, boardroom to talk about this because the, the unfortunate uh, problem is that a lot of people who are on the line who are in maintenance and reliability get, uh, you know, lumbered with this whole process of reliability improvement. And then it's very hard to sell it as a maintenance person to the board. They, they need to hear it almost from somebody from the outside who can tell them about, you know, what the, the value of this is, because they don't really understand that this is not, I mean, a maintenance issue. And you, you said it there yourself, um, you cannot maintain your way to better reliability. That, right. That's the key to the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, and you're preaching to the converted on the line tonight, I have no <laughs> doubt. I don't imagine there's too many operations people on the line. And that's the challenge that we have. Uh, yeah. We all have to try and sell it to operations and leadership teams a little bit better. Well, one, one other comment so, on this. Keep going, is, right? Yeah, sorry, but let me make one additional comment. When sure. you bring somebody in from the outside, you have to, in, internally, you have to create an infrastructure that sustains whatever it is you're doing. Mm. You can't, they can't just sweep through, train you, and then you go somewhere else and everything collapses. So it has to be some sort of infrastructure systems put in place to sustain it. So, okay. Yeah. Okay, next question is from Gary Tyne from Pro Reliability Solutions. And his question is, what characteristics are typical of a company when it is clear that reliability has transitioned from being something that is achieved to something that is being living as a, as a day-to-day -day, um, part of their operations? Yeah, hey, Gary. Uh, shout out to Gary. He and I used to work uh, on some projects at Syngenta, I think it was, you know, it's in our prior lives. <laughs> so, um the, I guess, first off, I, I said it in the presentation, having reliability and safety, operational excellence and safety on the same level, getting the same uh, level of executive attention, because the more unreliable, the poorer operationally you do, the greater the risk of injury, along with lower profits, lower output and all that sort of thing. The other thing is that the organization has to be aligned and the, the culture of reliability has to permeate the organization. It has to be indoctrinated into everybody from the CEO, site manager, middle managers down to the shop floor. And when you'll know you have it is when somebody leaves and it's, it just carries on. You know, it's not dependent on an individual it's dependent on the culture you've created, the infrastructure and the systems that you've established that just like safety, it gets carried on. It's, you know, it's, it's not yeah. optional based on who's there. It's part of how you do business. Yeah. So yeah. it's part of your organizational culture. It's endemic within the, you know, the DNA, if you will, of the organization. Okay. And very, very few companies have that. Yeah, so Eric Bergen asked the question then, uh, you know, from your your wide experience of traveling the, the globe, what cultures, locations or industries have you come across where production and maintenance partnerships actually work? Or was it, <laughs> was it, was it because of any of the above? <laughs> well, uh, sadly, okay, it's, it's more of a uh, site-specific, personality-specific. You know, I've seen it work really well in a given site at a given operation where the site manager said, we're going to do this. And then the production and maintenance manager said, oh, you mean we're going to do this? And, and so from there, it just became a part of, you know, of how they behave. So I, I don't think that there's, you know, if, if I look across the globe, I don't think there's any one culture that does this better than another. The, the place where I've seen it work best is Brazil. Oh. But that was specific 
to a company in Brazil that started out with a greenfield operation and implemented, you know, built, designed, built the plant and implemented the processes as yeah. a part of building the plant. So it was a greenfield type operation. Okay. So, yeah. Pretty uh, good. But, but, you know, I, again, I think the leadership has to expect this stuff and then it's more likely to happen. Yeah, a, a question here from uh, Chloe Curry. Uh, she says, throughout your career, have you had many mentors in your jobs? And have they helped you to get where you are now? Uh, sure. You know, is the short answer. I've had some bad mentors. <laughs> <laughs> you know, okay. I don't want to be like them. <laughs> and I've had some really good mentors. Uh, and in truth, I, I think to some extent that depends on each individual's personality. You know, my personality is give me some simple, you know, instructions, direction, and so on, and then leave me alone. If I need you, I'll come yeah. and see you. <laughs> On the end, other folks need much more uh, what specific instructions, guidance, and, and coaching. And so it is going to be dependent on, you know, the individual. But yes, I've had, uh, I've had lots of really good mentors. One of, my, one of my college professors was really good in terms of teaching me to think yes. and challenge mm -hmm. and so on. Very and good. I've, yeah, I've had lots, you know. Good. We're going to finish. Last question then is, uh, this is an easy one. If there was only one thing you could do to improve reliability at a plant, what would it be? It's from Mark Crosby. <laughs> <laughs> well, one, one thing now, only one. Yeah, one thing. I would get the site leadership team in a room and I would take them through this all day and get them to pick three things that they're going to go do and then follow up on that. So okay. that'd Excellent. be the one thing. That's where I, I, I just, that's where I've had the most success at a site. Yeah, yeah. Where I've had the most success in a corporation is where I've done that same thing at the uh, C-suite level, you know, at the CEO, VP yes, level. Yes, yes. Okay. It's the it's all about the buy in at the top level from we'll say the non technical people getting them to buy into the concept is the, the only place to start. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Right. Well, look, we're we're up against the time. Um, just one minute and a couple of closing comments. First of all, a big thank you, Ron, for a, a brilliant presentation, and everybody has come on and and made some comments there about how well it was uh, presented and the content, and you know, thankfully. We will have the PDF version for everybody who wants it. And we'll also uh, have a recording available on the Engineers Ireland YouTube channel. So if you want to look at it, this again uh, and take some of the uh, great ideas, uh, if you want to show them to your C-suite, why not put the video on in the plant and show it to the plant leader uh, yeah, or send, send it to your CEO or whatever you want to do. Uh, it's there and it's available. And this is something different that we have this year, you know, because we have the webinars, we can do this. It's it's actually helping us to spread the word a little bit more. Um, I just, I, I want to say, you know, from my own personal perspective, I've worked with Ron in the past and he's been um, a great mentor for me. And please go in and have a look on Amazon on some of the books that he's produced because they really are worth reading as well. Great backup material with a lot of detail around what we heard tonight. Tonight was a real snapshot given the time that we have. That's unfortunately as much as we could do, but those books will fill an awful lot of the gaps for you. So I encourage you to go in and search for them. Uh, I want to thank Maureen as well for organizing the webinar again. Uh, this has been our third one and it's gone really well. Thank you for that, Maureen. I want to thank the um, Meta Asset Management events team for putting this all together and organizing it. And, and we have many more webinars coming this year so keep an eye out it's a simple way to contact us go into linkedin and type in me to asset management and you'll get all the information and you can follow us and you can see what we do and what events are coming up and please join um, and help spread the word of how to do better asset management